Grab a seat. I'm grateful that you are in the house tonight. And I just am so in awe of those moments of, of really, really authentic and genuine and powerful worship. And I hope that you're ready tonight. I'm ready. I'm excited to preach. I'm excited to talk about what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm not going to hold anything back. I only ask that you do the same. I hope that you will make the journey with me over the next uh, few minutes. And I'm going to do my best to be on time tonight. Been praying about it all day, and we'll see how that works out. But uh, as I, as I, just kind of a quick update on where we're at. We're in a series called "The Good News Is Good," uh, walking through the Gospel of Mark in hopes that we can see and reflect the glory of God more clearly and more genuinely in our life. And today we're going to jump to Mark chapter four. Last week at the end of the message, we landed halfway through Mark chapter two, so we're making a pretty big jump. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, we released a video teaching on our YouTube page. Uh, this weekend uh, that covers the end of chapter two and chapter three. And there's a couple reasons that we had to kind of jump forward. One of them is the calendar. Two, uh, you guys don't want me to preach for an hour and a half every single night this semester. So uh, we had to kind of get creative with how we were going to cover some ground. The idea that we left off with last week was uh, this idea that your pain and my pain and our pain as a culture and as people and as individuals, it is never the ending when the king is in the room. And the king's in the room tonight. The king wants to meet with you tonight. The king wants to meet with me tonight. The king wants to deal and help and support and care for us tonight. So as we pull apart Mark chapter four, I hope that we can do it through that lens. If you have your Bible with you, we're gonna jump right in. You can hold it up in the air and just declare that we're looking to it tonight to understand it, to read it, to apply it, uh, and to ask God to reveal himself through it and I'm just really, really excited about the message tonight. Mark chapter four, verse one. If you didn't get a reading plan on the way in, make sure you get one on the way out so you can keep reading along with us each day during the week. Mark chapter four begins like this. Once again, Mark says, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd, a very large crowd, soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. And he taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. And as he scattered it across the field, some of the seed fell on the footpath and the birds came and ate it. And other seed fell on the shallow soil with underlying rock. And the seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun. And since it did not have deep roots, it, it died. Other seed fell among the thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plant, so they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they 60 and even 100, 30, 60, and even 100 times as much had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears should hear and listen and understand. Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and with the others that were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God, but I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. And those who hear the message uh, on the earth, the, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan at come at once and take it away. And the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message immediately and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots and they don't last very long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or, or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represent those who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth and the desire of other things. So no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on the good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest 30, 60, or even a hundred times as much had, as had been planted. And then Jesus asked them, would anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light will shine for everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open and every secret will be brought into the light. Anyone with ears should hear and listen and understand. And then he added, pay, pay close attention to what you hear. 
The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given, and you will receive even more. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. God, thank you. Thank you for Mark. Thank you for him writing all of this down underneath your inspiration. God, thank you for overflow. Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for our time together. And God, thank you for the miracle that grace is. God, I pray that we would take hold of it. We would see, learn, and understand more about you tonight. We say this in the name of Jesus. I started seminary a couple weeks ago, and it has been an unbelievable journey uh, so far. I've been in it a couple weeks, and I remember the first night that I started classes, I opened up uh, the, the Canvas portal. Uh, I'm on Canvas. Shout out to anybody who deals with, I mean, uh, has Canvas. Uh, but I, I log in, and the first assignment is to read the syllabus. And I haven't been in school in seven years. And so I was like, okay, that seems pretty easy. We get points for reading the syllabus. I don't know how UNCW or Cape Fear does it. Do you get points for reading the syllabus? That is right. That is good. It's like, you don't have to do anything except for just say you read the syllabus. And I, I'm, I'm in seminary, so you, you can't lie on the quiz, right? You're studying God. You can't lie about reading the syllabus, even though I thought about it. Uh, so I, I read the entire syllabus, and I get to the bottom of the page of the syllabus, and I see this seven page paper that I'm gonna have to write. And I was like, okay, that sounds good. Only problem is I don't understand what it's about. Like the, the list of terms that the seven page paper is about, I've never heard of these terms in my entire life. I work for a church. I have worked here for 11 years. I grew up in Christian school. I have studied the Bible. I study the Bible all the time. And I have never heard of some of these terms. And I'm like, what is going to happen over the next 16 weeks? I start to absolutely freak out. I'm like, my wife's having another, we're, we're having another baby. Overflow's going crazy. I have a couple part-time jobs. I'm like, what, what am I going to do? And in this moment, I am like, God, why did you tell me to go to seminary? Because the mountain looks really, really tall. What I learned in that moment and I came face to face with is the reality that the condition of my heart was off. There was something happening inside of me that wasn't in true form of being underneath the authority of following God's calling on my life. Because if I believe and if I put my faith in Jesus, that means that the condition of my heart should be informed by my faith. But the reality is, is the condition of our heart actually determines the depth of our faith. Our faith cannot, cannot be any deeper then our heart and our soul and our mind and, our, and our, our body to some extent in the way that we perceive and understand information can be healthy. And when we think about like the way to apply this and the way to understand this, the thing that's really important is if the condition of our heart determines the depth of our faith, we must really take every opportunity that God goes off script as an opportunity to evaluate the condition of our heart. And in the moment, sitting there reading the syllabus, it's like, God, you have gone completely rogue. You brought me here and you set me here and you have given me this goal and I don't know how it's gonna happen. And then there's something that happens inside of me. Is the issue me or is the issue what God has called me to do? The clear answer is the issue resides with me. And I think when we think about this, when we think about the condition of our heart, and the fact that it determines the depth of our faith. The depth of our faith, overflow, is a matter of life and death. The depth of our faith as people, it's a matter of life and death. And now I'm not talking about physical death, I'm talking about spiritual death. I'm talking about living a life worthy of the calling that we have received. I'm talking about breathing life into every room that you walk in. I'm talking about breathing in life in the way that you see the world, the way that you interact with your friends, the way that you attend overflow, the way that you go to work in the morning, the way that you go to class in the morning at 8 a.m., the way that you interact with life, it matters. And all of that gets funneled through where your faith lies, which is why this entire section of Matthew chapter four is so critically important. 
Because Jesus is pointing out the reality of the condition of our hearts. So let's go back to the beginning of the chapter and look at kind of the context that leads the way into these parables that point to the condition of our heart. And in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lakeshore, and a very large crowd uh, soon gathered around him. Something to know is if you read the, the Gospel of Mark from cover to cover, you'll find uh, that the word crowd is mentioned 38 times. There was always a crowd around the Jesus movement. He was wildly popular. So he got into a boat. And I would just recommend underline that he got into a boat because that's going to be relevant at the end of the message tonight. And I think that the connection between these two things is something that Mark wants us to see. He wants us to understand how these two sections of the story are are connected and correlated to each other. And then in verses two through eight, Jesus fires off this parable where he says, the farmer comes along, he plants a seed and some fell uh, on the footpath and they got kind of snatched up and some fell in the the rocks and they they didn't really grow roots very deep. So they died because of the sun. And then some grew, you know, among the thorns and they got choked out by the thorns, but then some some landed on healthy soil. And as a result, they multiplied 30 times 60 times 100, which would be absolutely unheard of in an agriculture culture of that day. Everybody, for the most part, was a farmer. And they're like, no, there's no miracle grow yet. There's no Home Depot to buy the steroid for the plant. That doesn't exist. Like the multiplication factor made no sense to them. And Jesus is like, he ends it with saying, anyone who has ears should listen and understand. And you got to think that his disciples and that all the very large crowd uh, gathered around him while Mary in mind, he's sitting in a boat talking about farming. It's like, hey, dude, that doesn't make sense. Like, I I have no idea how to apply that in my life. And that's what the disciples say down in verse 10. It says that Mark says they they asked him, "What, what do these parables mean? And I just love their faith in this moment where they had a question about what God was saying, about what Jesus was saying. And they just asked it. How many of you have questions about God that you're afraid to ask? When you have a question, ask it. Start talking, start writing in your journal, call somebody, come to Overflow down front after and talk to somebody on our team. Ask your questions. God is never and will never be afraid of your questions. Far more people walk away from the faith because they did not ask the questions that they needed to ask, not the answers that they found on the other side of those questions. So Jesus' response is, you are permitted, talking to the disciples, to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God. But I use parables for everything I say to outsiders. It's like outsiders. And some of you that you're on the fence about faith and you're on the fence about church. You're like, yes, this is the text where the church is against people. Their founder is against people and there's no way that I can be a part of that. Well, check out what comes next. So the scriptures might be fulfilled. He's talking about Isaiah chapter six. It happened a thousand years before. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When I hear what they say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. What he's pointing to is the condition of their heart is not in a healthy enough condition to understand what it is that I'm saying. And you've got to evaluate the condition of your heart. But the truth is the condition of your heart always stems from your source of truth. And we live in 2024 and I don't think that it's any different today than it was then. The culture had a version of truth. We hear this in our world very consistently. Well, my truth, you've got to trust my truth. And then I've even heard it in church circles where it's it's my Jesus, It's, it's my God. There is no such thing as your Jesus or your truth. There is only Jesus. And Jesus is saying, until you understand that, you won't be able to grasp the power of my message. And I think that you've got to understand and that I've got to understand that if you are married to your truth, then you will never be transformed by Jesus's truth. If you are in lockstep with what your version of truth is, you will never fully grasp and understand the power of the capital T truth of Jesus. 
Because the condition of our heart informs our ability to understand. We've got to consider what is the version of truth that you are holding on to. Because in the parables that follow, every time that you think about what soil means, it's in reference to the condition of your heart. And if the condition of your heart stems from your version of truth or your version of reality, it's worth paying very, very close attention to. And when you think about it, like this large crowd gathered around Jesus, what came right before it? Jesus healed at least five people leading up to this moment in Mark. And there's actually a section where it says he healed everybody who came to him. So let's even give him just a few more people that were included in that group. So it's like he's like winning every single game. He's seven, he's seven oh, he's eight oh, he's doing really, really good. And people are going, what's the secret? And this is his response. So he pulls it apart for the disciples and he breaks it down. And as we go, the thing that I want us to realize, if we look a layer deeper, we'll find that as he talks about what the the unhealthy soil looks like, he's actually giving us a window into what the healthy soil looks like. So in verse 13, it says that Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? Kind of a little dig. The farmer plants the seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. And it's this idea that if you are indifferent towards God, if you are indifferent towards faith, or if you are indifferent towards the activity of your life, truth is going to get taken away from you because the world is going to redefine it. The enemy is going to convince you that there is such a thing as your truth. And we think about indifference. Indifference is actually a preference. I'll prove it to you. If you were to go to lunch, this is a hypothetical scenario. If you were to go to lunch with a group of friends and you guys start talking about where you're gonna go eat and there's one person in the group that is standing in the circle and their arms are crossed and they don't say anything the entire time that you are arguing about discussing, discussing where you're gonna go eat. You decide that you're going to a hypothetical place, PTs, whatever. Okay, some people are gonna laugh at me because I go to PTs all the time. And you're like, we're gonna go to PTs. And then that person with their arms crossed that says, says, yeah, that's fine. That's not my preference. You're like, where have you been? We have been talking about this for the past 20 minutes. And they're like, no, it's just just not my preference, but I'll go. That is a a preference. They say they're like, they don't care, but they, they, they actually do care. Indifference is it's actually kind of a myth. We all have preferences. And Jesus is saying, if your preference supersedes your trust in his will and in his way, you're going to miss the truth to begin with. You're gonna miss out on the heart transformation that he came to give. And when you think about the way that all of this connects, I think that we do this in our faith through phrases like, I don't care, or it's not a big deal. That's you being indifferent towards what God is calling you to do. Or a phrase like, it's just one time. I'm just gonna sleep with them one time. I'm just gonna go to the party one time. I'm just gonna talk bad about that person one time because I've gotta get it off my chest. And then I'll go back to loving and living in the way of Jesus. I'll criticize everybody else just when I'm with that group of friends. And and, and that's okay because I, I need a safe place to process. Or God, does God really care about that? Does God, does, does, God doesn't really care about my sex life. God, God doesn't really care about how I spend my time. That is indifference. And Jesus is saying that is dangerous for the condition of your heart. When we allow ourselves to become indifferent, we fail to experience the life that Jesus gives us. We breathe in death to our heart, to the condition of our soul. Indifference leads us to a lot of things. Chief among them, putting God on do not disturb. It leads us to getting dumped because we didn't care for our relationship well. It leads us to cheating. It leads us to addiction. It leads us to porn. It leads us to failing out of school. It leads us to getting fired from our job. It leads us to unhealthy habits. And the list just goes on. 
We cannot afford to be an indifferent generation. We must be an intentional generation. A generation that says, I'm not gonna use the phrase, it just doesn't matter. Or that's not my preference. Or I have my version of truth. And what's the solution to that? Two things, gratitude and revelation. Gratitude expands perspective every single time. And revelation helps us see reality through the lens of God. Revelation is looking to God and saying, I want to see the world through your lens. I want to see my life through what you have for my life. I don't want to be indifferent about anything in my life. I do not want to be standing in the corner with my arms crossed saying, I have my version of truth because I trust that your version of truth is far, far better than my version of truth could ever be. And I want to live in your way. That is saying, I'm going to follow and allow God to do something in my life, to plant a seed in my life. The only way that you get there is choosing to be consistently grateful and consistently pursue revelation. And I have a a really short prayer that I've been praying for the past couple of weeks in the morning and at night. And I want to give it to you. I just want to encourage you. I want you to write it down and I want you to pray it a thousand times a day. And I'm not trying to get in your space too much tonight. No, just kidding. Uh, but I, but I, I, I want you to take this seriously. And it's very, very simple. And the first one, and the first line is, God, thank you. God, thank you. When I think about my life and I think about all the things happening in my life, I just need to start with, God, thank you. And then God, help me. God, thank you. God, help me. 30 minutes ago, I was sitting right back there Just saying, God, thank you. God, help me. It changes the perspective of my heart. When I think about the syllabus that scares me and my response is, God, thank you. God, help me. Something happens in my heart that changes the way that I see everything else. So that's the first section of soil. The question for us to wrestle with here is your indifference in life is, the indifference that you might be exemplifying in your life, is it preventing you from experiencing God's presence? You are the only one who knows the answer to that. And are you okay with the fruit of indifference? Are you okay with the list of things that I just mentioned? I'm willing to bet everything that you're not. What you need, if that's you, is gratitude and revelation. The next soil is the rocky soil. He says that seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last very long and they fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. And I think that this is just this big kind of fun word to say, superficiality. Where our faith is just superficial. Where we are living a double life. Where, if I can, just for a second, we come to Overflow on Tuesday nights and we sing and we take notes and then we go back to campus or back to our our apartment or back to our house and back with our family and we're a completely different person because we're scared of taking our faith into those rooms. And I don't wanna shame you. That is not my goal at all. But I do wanna ask you to consider how healthy that is for the condition of your heart. What is that doing to your faith? Just listening, it isn't enough. I would dare say just reading, it isn't enough. A superficial faith will never, ever, ever be a transforming faith. And Jesus is saying, you can't leave this thing on the surface. You can't afford to do it for the sake of what other people think about you. And how do you, how do you combat that? What's the antidote for the rocky soil? What's the antidote for being shallow in your faith? Two really simple things, activity and consistency. Activity despite conditions, following God d- despite what room you're in, following God no matter what your professor says, following God no matter how your boss treats you. Choosing the way of Jesus, even when people talk bad about you. Following God when you want to sleep with them so bad because they are so hot. Say, no, no, 
God has a vision for my sex life. And I'm gonna trust that it's better than mine because I'm gonna trust that God can see more than I can. To choose to be an active person in your faith, even when it's gonna cost you something, even when no one is watching. This is why James, the brother of Jesus, said this. He said, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. No, no one wants to be a fool. And no one's calling you a fool. But it's time to get active. And it's time to be consistent. Consistency over perfection, by the way. If you miss the mark, you get back on the horse. Because you don't want to have a shallow faith. You don't want to struggle with superficiality. Be the same person everywhere you go. Maybe that's some of you, you just need to make that your goal this year. And maybe that means that you're a little less good in some situations, but just be consistent so that God can work and pull apart some things in your life. Because what you do consistently, it actually stems from your place of true dependency. What you depend on the most informs what you are gonna be the most consistent in. And I think it's time that we as a generation and we as a world and we as a culture take a hard look at what we are depending the most on. Whatever is keeping your faith on the surface overflow has got to go. If it's a friend group, if it's a boyfriend, if it's a girlfriend, if it's a wake up time, if it's a bedtime, if it's a setting, if it's an environment, if it's a class, I don't care what it is, it's got to go. Why? Faith is a matter of life and death. And Jesus came so that we could have life and life to the full. But we've got to take him at his word. So then the next one is the thorns. This is my favorite one because this is where I struggle the most. Verse 18. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things. So no, no fruit is produced. Now think about this in the way of obsession. I think that a lot of times, if we're just being really honest, we are pretty obsessed about certain things. We, we think about something or we find something that we like. We find a hobby that we like. We find a person that we like. We find a habit that we like. And we are very, very quick to become very, very obsessed. And I think a lot of the things in life that are really, really good, we give ourselves a free pass to obsess over them. Because like, that's not an unhealthy thing. Yes, I'm holding a rose. That's not, that's not an unhealthy thing, right? It's a good thing. It's just like a rose. Boys, check this out. Valentine's Day is coming. This is a flower. You can get them at Harris Teeter. Uh, this one was $14.99. Yeah, that's what I thought. But I'm gonna give it to my wife when I get home at midnight. But uh, here's the thing. Don't be weird on Valentine's Day, by the way. Uh, th th this, this is important because this signifies something really, really good. But what I don't think you can see, maybe you can, that doesn't help. It has thorns. Every good thing in life except for Jesus, if you hold on to it long enough, you're gonna find that it has thorns too. Obsessing over anything but Jesus will hurt you in the long run. Because Jesus is the source of life. Faith in him is how we experience life and life to the full. And this is where he's saying, the lure of wealth and the desire for other things and the worries of this life, those could represent seemingly by the world good things, but they're still gonna cost you something because they're not me. I think one example of this, I should be gentle with that, is timelines. This is a calendar from 2023, sorry. We think about this a lot when we're in our 18 to 25 year old stage of life, where it's like, I'm gonna graduate college here, and I'll, I'll be ready to get married. And then God's gonna drop down 
a Paul out of the sky. Sorry, Jesus joke. And it's going to be perfect. And then we're going to get married. And then we're going to have three kids. And all this will be done by 30 so that they'll graduate by the time that we're 50. And then we're going to go to the Maldives for a couple weeks as a retired couple. And we're going to have billions of dollars in the bank. And it's going to be awesome. And then the minute that the timeline falls apart, the minute you can't find anybody to date, and you're thinking about the fact that you're just getting older. And you're, somebody, <laughs> <laughs> Valentine's Day is coming for whoever said that. Somebody said preach. <laughs> I, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> I'm back. But we carry around our timeline where we, what we think is right. And we talk to God, and we're like, hey, I got this good timeline, because plans aren't bad. And when the timeline doesn't work out, our faith begins to get choked out. Because we're holding God to a promise that he never made. He's like, I didn't give you the timeline. I said, I'm going to be with you in the timeline. Don't worship the timeline. So we as a generation, <laughs> wow, can we tear up the timeline? Can we stop living underneath the authority of when things should happen? Instead say, God, I trust you no, ma no matter what happens. And if, and if I don't meet the perfect person, if I don't graduate on time, yeah, your mom's gonna be stressed and just give her my phone number. Like it, <laughs> don't, but like it. I don't know who needs to hear this tonight. It's gonna be okay. Because the timeline that you're stressing about right now, you're not even gonna remember 10 years from now. But 10 years from now, the condition of your heart is going to have been formed by your obsession of the timeline. And I think that we as a generation, we must pay close attention to the timeline that we're holding up to God, saying, hey God, if you love me, you'll execute this. I think we think about this, we obsess over opportunities. The perfect job opportunity, the perfect boss, the perfect salary. And we think about, we look back at closed doors in our life and we're like, man, that was, that was a missed opportunity. I didn't get that job or that relationship didn't work out. But the truth is, if you view it through God writing your story, the closed door that you're obsessing over right now might 10 years from now be a closed door that you are like, thank God, I'll prove it to you. Some of you were dating people in middle school. And you were like, God, they're the one. Like, I, I. guys, you were like buying ring pops. You were like ready to walk down the aisle. And now you look them up. And you're like, thanks, God. You knew something that I didn't. Silly example. But some of you, you didn't get the job. And you're mad at God. You're like, God, why did you slam that door in my face? And God's like saying, hey, just watch. Don't let obsession choke your faith. Because you can't see everything that I can see. And how do you combat the thorns? You live in holy expectation of what God's gonna do next. You live in holy expectation of what God might do, of what God's gonna do. But you just gotta be careful not to tell God what to do. You just gotta say, God, it's gonna, it's gonna be better your way. And for those of us that are checking it out, that spells grace. If you didn't know that, we'll talk after. It spells grace. Because what makes soil healthy? What makes the condition of your life healthy? There's one thing. It's the grace of Jesus in your life. How do you live into that grace? You choose gratitude. You choose God's divine revelation. 
you choose to have distinct and set apart activity and consistency. And you live wholly expectant for what God is going to do next. You don't take your eyes off of him. That's what healthy soil looks like. And you see it in all the places that Jesus is talking about, the unhealthy soil. So just moving on, my clock is officially red. Here we go. Mark chapter 4, verse 21 is the parable of the lamp. And this matters a lot to me. I, I really want us to understand this. Because when you think about it, when you walk out of here, you see the banners hanging above the thing. And it's we want to become a devoted and a winsome generation. We didn't get that idea on our own volition. That's Jesus' idea. And we see it beginning to take shape in verse 21, where he says, Then Jesus asked them, Would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light will shine to everyone. And the thing is, we've got to remember that this is foreshadowing. Jesus is saying to them, I'm explaining these things to you so that one day you will explain them to other people and build the church. Acts chapter one, verse eight, he talks about how we're going to be witnesses to every corner of the earth. Witnesses is plural. And when you think about this idea that he's talking about, it's going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. The problem is, the church of today, we're struggling to live solely rooted in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me show this to you. Carly, you can turn the lights off. This is, this is, this is where we live. 2023, Wilmington, North Carolina, unless you're watching online, we live in a dark world. And Jesus is the light of it. And he has given us light. Just for a second. He has, he has, he has given us light to share with, the, oh, thank you, to, to share with the world. But we choose not to. And I think one of the biggest reasons we as a generation choose not to share the light of the world, it's really simple. It's a simple phrase. I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling going to church today. You can turn this light. Back on Carly, sorry for the confusion. I'm not feeling it. Cover it up. Oh, we go to Overflow. We feel good. We feel excited. I'm going to take this to UNCW. I'm going to take this to my job. Oh, what do they think? Well, what if they think I'm one of those weird Jesus people? Light gets recovered. Oh, like I'm experiencing God's light in my life. But what about dating? What about the perfect one? We cover the light up for ourselves. All underneath the phrase of I'm not feeling it. We can't afford to be a generation that doesn't accept the calling that God has on our life underneath the phrase and authority of a feeling. We can't afford to do that. Because Jesus is saying, I am light and I've given you light. And my only request is that you take that light to every person on planet earth. Those who understand, let them hear. Let them carry my message. We can turn the lights back on. Don't use the phrase, I'm not feeling it when so much is at stake. Because no one lights a light and puts it under a bowl. No one lights a light and puts it under the bed. Because faith is not a feeling. It's a way of living. Faith is not, has never been, and will never be a feeling. And the minute that we reduce it to a feeling, the condition of our heart greatly diminishes and the soil of our life becomes unhealthy. Why? Because we need grace. We need gratitude. We need revelation. We need activity. We need consistency. We need holy expectation that when we let the light of Jesus shine in our life, it's going to do more than we could ever imagine, which is what Jesus points to. And by talking about the law of multiplication, that it multiplies 30 times 60 times 100. And he points to it again in verse 26, which we did not read earlier, but I want to read it really, really quick right now. It's where Jesus also said that the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground night and day, 
while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. And it's Jesus saying, your understanding on how I do work in the world and how the Holy Spirit's gonna move in the world has no, no bearing on my ability to do a miracle or to put, create something better in your life than you originally planned for. Don't obsess. Don't be superficial. Don't be indifferent. And he goes on in verse 29, and it says, as soon as the grain is ready, talking about what was planted, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle for the harvest time has come. You don't need your timeline because the farmer who knows more than you do is gonna determine when the time for harvest is. Your job is just stay faithful and don't for a minute believe that God has forgotten you. And as a reminder, he gives us the parable of the mustard seed in verses 30 through 32, where he says, it is the smallest of all seeds, but it has become the largest of all garden plants, referring to how the kingdom of God works. It grows long branches and birds make its nests or make their nests in its shade. Small faith leads to big faith. And big faith leads to a big kingdom where people find rest, where people find care, where people find support in their journey to improving the condition of their heart so that their faith can be deepened, so that they can breathe in and out life, not death. Is your life growing to be a place where people find rest and experience the light of Jesus? Because if you think that it takes a huge amount of faith, you have disagreed with Jesus. Jesus says, it's a small amount of faith in Jesus' truth that gets multiplied far, far greater than you could ever imagine. What comes next is Jesus calming the storm. And verse 35, it says, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Remember the beginning when I told you to underline that he was sitting in a boat? This whole time he's talking about farming and planting seeds and how important the condition of our heart is. He's sitting in the very boat that is about to take the disciples to attest. When you get revelation from God, be ready to attest to it because God is not gonna miss an opportunity to stretch and deepen your faith. They begin to paddle out. The storm starts raging. If you know the story, the disciples begin to absolutely freak out. Mark happens to record that Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. The storm didn't surprise Jesus. The storm that's in your life right now didn't surprise him either. But notice what his question is when they get him up and they're like, dude, teacher, we're gonna drown. So Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence and be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? You've already forgotten everything that I just taught you. The condition of your heart determines the depth of your faith and your fear has corrupted the condition of your heart and therefore choked out your faith. And notice what he talks about. He's talking about faith, not physical life because he's trying to help them understand that the most important thing for them to cultivate is not their current present day earthly circumstances. The matter of life and death truly is the depth of their faith. Because when God goes off script, there's something happening beneath the surface. And we get to experience that when we tend to the condition of our heart. When I was looking at the syllabus a couple weeks ago, I forgot who called me there in the first place. The disciples in the boat, they forgot who called them there in the first place. They forgot to simply be grateful that they were in the boat with the king, that they were in the boat 
with the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, the God of all creation. And what's the first part of the message tonight? It's to choose gratitude. It's to choose to fix our attention and our gaze and our eyes on Jesus anyway, even if we're in the middle of the storm, because the condition of our heart determines the depth of our faith, which is a matter of life and death. Jesus, we thank you for tonight. God, thank you for this word. God, I pray that we would all be people that tend to the condition of our heart. We experience your goodness, that we trust you no matter what, and that we would do that confidently by saying, God, thank you. God, help me.